All right, well, to uh, respect the time, I'd like to welcome everyone officially to the Mossbacker Institute for Trade Economics and Public Policy's International Economics Policy Talk. I am extremely thrilled and delighted to be hosting Gordon Hansen today. Gordon Hansen, Professor Gordon Hansen, is the Peter Wertheim Professor in Urban Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a life member of the Council of Foreign Relations, and a co-editor of the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Hansen received his PhD in economics from MIT in 92 and his BA in economics from Occidental College in 1986. And prior to joining Harvard last year, he was uh, the Pacific Economic Cooperation Chair in International Economic Relations at UC San Diego, where he was the founding director of the Center on Global Transformation. He's previously served on the economics faculties of the University of Michigan and the University of Texas. His scholarship focuses on international trade, international migration, and economic geography, and he's published extensively in top economics journals and is widely cited for his research by scholars from across the social sciences and frequently quoted by regional uh, and national media outlets. Today, he's joining us to talk about some of his latest research on regional economic divides in the United States. And that's a topic obviously that is incredibly important given the fact that it transcends economics and goes into politics. And so if you'll please join me in welcoming Professor Gordon Hansen. Uh, thanks very much, Raymond. Um, Raymond didn't mention that uh, he was one of my uh, first students uh, to, uh, who I advised on his PhD. And so our relationship, our professional relationship and personal relationship uh, goes, uh, goes way back. I'm very proud to count uh, Raymond as, as one of my students. I will um, jump right into the presentation here. And um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is the economic differences that divide communities in, uh, in America. Uh, and this gets at the heart of something that is core to the political divisions that we've been experiencing as a, as a country for some time now and that have really come to head in, in recent years. And this is the sense among many in the US that they've been left behind economically, uh, that there are parts of the economy concentrated on in big cities on the East Coast and the West Coast, and then a number of places throughout the middle of the country, uh, several Texas cities, uh, Houston, uh, Dallas, Austin, among them that have been thriving, but smaller town, medium-sized city America of uh, rural America uh, has struggled. What I'd like to talk to you about today is where those struggles come from um, and what we know about what we can do uh, to begin to close these divides. So to begin, I'd like you just to just imagine in your mind what a healthy economy, uh, a local economy looks like. This can be the town where you come from or a town that you feel like you know well, it can be a big city, it can be a small city, but just think visually uh, about the attributes that would uh, describe such a place. So as you're, as you're thinking about that, I'll just show you an image of a town that I pass through every day on my way to work. Uh, this is Harvard Square in Cambridge, um, not too far from the Kennedy School of Government. And what distinguishes uh, Harvard Square is got a lot of businesses, got a lot of people milling around. Um, and the, the a central feature, which is core to healthy economies everywhere, is that everybody has something to do. Um, you have students, you have workers, uh, you have shopkeepers, uh, you have professors. Cambridge is a town with very high employment rates. So if you thought about some of the attributes of, of what makes a place uh, successful, what does is, what is economic health uh, look like? You might have imagined uh, good schools. You might have imagined good jobs available uh, to local workers. You might have uh, uh, imagined lots of businesses uh, forming or companies that are at the forefront of, of technology in one way or another. But what I'd like to get you to focus on is just one simple diagnostic measure of economic health, and that's the employment rate. As it turns out, if we just look at the fraction of prime age workers, that is workers who are at uh, between 25 and 50, 54 years old. That's when employment rates tend to be highest for individuals. It's, it's after when people have uh, completed their studies or, or most people, uh, and it's before when people began to retire. We just look at the fraction of adults between 25 and 54 
uh, who are employed, who have a job. That tells us most of what we need to know about the economic health uh, of a place. And that metric helps us understand the nature of economic divides in the US and the manner in which those uh, divides have increased over time. So I'm gonna show you uh, two maps uh, which tell the story about changing employment rates across time and space, and then interpret those maps as, uh, as, as characterizing the economic divides that, that we today encounter as a country. So the first map uh, shows you for uh, cities in the US, and these are cities defined in a pretty broad area. It's how, uh, it's what the census, the US Bureau of the Census does to define uh, economic regions. So some of these places are gonna be self-contained uh, cities. So here would be Houston right here. And other areas like uh, rural uh, West and Central Texas are gonna be one large area uh, uh, unto themselves. So this map is color-coded such that uh, darker colors indicate a higher fraction of individuals who are not working. Um, and I'm focusing here on men. Uh, uh, just to keep things simple. So this, uh, this map shows you the fraction of men, 25 to 54 years old, who in 1980 were not working. Uh, what you get a sense of is places in which uh, more than 25% of people are jobless are pretty rare. We've got a few red regions here in Appalachia, a part of the United States where economic hardship has been endemic. We've got a bit uh, on tribal lands in um, uh, in Arizona, uh, some in Northern California uh, and in Northern Idaho and, uh, and Northwestern Montana. But places in which employment rates are low, meaning jobless rates uh, are, are high, as of 1980 were pretty rare. So jump to 2015, the map looks really different. Now we've got red all over the place. Uh, we now have a much larger number of communities uh, in which joblessness is high, uh, above 20%, above 25%, in a number of these places above 40 or 50%. That joblessness is a sign that things are just not working in these places. Joblessness is correlated with a bunch of other bad economic outcomes. Um, the higher is the rate of joblessness, not surprisingly, the lower are average wages. The higher is joblessness, the less likely families are to form, the more likely uh, kids are going to be living with a single parent and living in poverty. It's also places where economic health tends to deteriorate. Places with higher rates of joblessness have higher rates of comorbidities, things like obesity and diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and places with higher joblessness are also where we've seen the opioid crisis uh, hit harder over the last two decades. Now, I'm not trying to draw a causal link there necessarily that joblessness has caused these things. These are events that evolve together. But what I wanna highlight for you is that at the core of what makes a local economy uh, dysfunctional, unhealthy, is this rate uh, of joblessness. So what I'd like to do in, the, in, the, in my talk today is talk about two things. Uh, one is, where did these regional economic divides come from? What were the economic events that triggered large differences in economic well-being across places? I'm going to quickly go through four major economic shocks that are responsible. Uh, one is technological change, in particular, the automation of many jobs uh, in the economy. Uh, a second is globalization, uh, and as embodied in particular in rising uh, import competition from China. A third is the ongoing energy transformation. This began most visibly with the decline of coal as an energy source, and now seems to be creeping into to affecting uh, employment in gas and oil-related industries too. And then five, and then four, uh, a factor I'll just mention, but I won't show you much data on, is that recessions, both the, the Great Recession that hit the U.S. economy in 2000, from 2007 to 2009, and now possibly the COVID-19 recession we're living through right now, these recessions tend to have long legs. That is, places that are hurt by them 
often take a long time to recover and some of the economic losses that are experienced during those time periods just stick around. So first, let's talk about uh, technological change. So when we say technological change, what we mean is the creation of new ideas that when firms apply them to produce goods and services, change the amount of labor that you need to make that stuff. Now, technology can change in a, in a bunch of different ways. If you go back a century, the major technological changes were electrification. Electrification meant that it was now possible to construct factories at a, a very large scale, employing large numbers of, of workers. Those workers were replacing formerly craft, high-skilled workers who might have worked with themselves and a, and a tool. Uh, so uh, innovations like electrification might have been uh, things that increase the demand for particular types of workers, factory workers, in, in, uh, uh, to be sure. Fast forward 60 years and the nature of technological change uh, have, have altered. The, the nature of new technologies that have been created since 1980, so this includes big advances in robotics, in machine tools, uh, in just-in-time inventories, in the way in which we manage and distribute goods, these tend to be labor-saving. They tend to allow firms to produce a given output with fewer workers, a given amount of, of output with fewer workers than they used before. The consequence of this, um, uh, of this automation is a change in the nature of work in the economy. Uh, this figure is taken from work by David Otter and, and Anna Solomons, and they've been looking over the last 70 years at the US labor market and evaluating what's, what types of jobs have been created and what types of jobs uh, have disappeared. And what you notice from 1980 forward very strongly in their work is that the jobs that are disappearing are what we think of as middle, middle skill jobs. So these are jobs on the factory floor. These are clerical jobs, administrative jobs, sales jobs. We call them middle skill because these were jobs that allowed workers who held them to attain a middle-class lifestyle. I mean, buying a home, buying a car, going on vacation, being able to send your kids uh, uh, to college. Automation changed the nature of work. We replaced workers with machines on the factory floor. Uh, we replaced clerical workers uh, with computers in offices, uh, and we replaced sales workers with uh, automated checkout in grocery stores, in banks, and other types of, of retail facilities. The consequence was what you see here is a decline in middle skill jobs. And here we're looking at the shares of employment. So all of these things kind of have to balance out what types of jobs were created to replace them. Well, for non-college educated workers, those were low skill jobs. And by low skill, we mean jobs that pay low wages. So these are cleaning and security jobs. Um, these are uh, uh, jobs that involve uh, personal services, taking care of kids or taking care uh, of the elderly. They tend to pay substantially less than the middle skill jobs that were disappearing. Now, some high school jobs were created too, uh, but for the non-college educated, most of those middle skill jobs were lost uh, at the bottom end. When we look at college educated workers, what you see is a parallel development. Middle skill jobs for college educated workers have disappeared too, but just not at the magnitude of what we see for the non-college educated. So the consequence of this, the disappearance of those jobs for people without a college education that allowed them to earn a middle-class living um, uh, meant wider income inequality. You now had more people without a college education stuck in lower wage positions, whereas the high wage positions were being primarily created for those uh, with uh, a college degree. So this is force one behind regional economic divides and the regional component comes here because many of these factory jobs uh, were located uh, in smaller towns uh, and cities. And that's what we come to next when we think about uh, globalization. So I want you to uh, imagine uh, the economic geography of the United States and think about what types of things big cities do versus the types of things 
that small and medium-sized towns do. You go back to 1900, when the US had just completed this incredible wave of industrialization, manufacturing jobs were urban jobs. Uh, factories were located in big cities, and big cities were where workers lived uh, and worked. Over the course of the 20th century, that changed. Factory jobs moved out of cities as services moved in. Professional workers in finance, in accounting, in law, in consulting, and then in information technology congregated in larger cities, making it too expensive for manufacturing to continue to locate in those places. Where did manufacturing go? Into smaller and medium-sized towns, uh, many of those located in the U.S. Southeast uh, and Midwest. So uh, when we entered uh, the recent phase of globalization that really took off uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, manufacturing workers in the United States were, uh, many of them were living in these small and medium-sized places. So what then happened? What happened uh, was China. And this is work I've done uh, over the last decade in concert with David Otter, who's an economist at MIT, and, and David Dorn, who's an economist at the University uh, of Zurich. China, in the, from the 1970s to the early 1990s, went through a simply astounding process of economic reform. It went from being one of the most closed, centrally planned economies in the world in the late 1970s to being a much more open uh, economy in the early 1990s, one that welcomed foreign, uh, foreign investment, one that uh, brought in new technology, and one that was strongly oriented towards producing exports for the rest of the world. What this meant, and this is what you see on the red line, is that the share of, of goods, of manufacturing goods in the global economy produced in China increased at an incredibly rapid rate, starting in the early mid-1990s and really culminating in the first decade uh, of the 2000s. In 1990, account, China accounted for less than 3% of world manufacturing exports. By the time you got to uh, 2015, it accounted for almost uh, 20%. What made that possible were those reforms I just mentioned. Second, an obvious thing, China being very big. And then a third thing that was perhaps less appreciated in that China for being such a big economy had a pretty narrow comparative advantage in labor intensive products. Things at the, when it first burst onto the global scene that included clothing and shoes, furniture, home fixtures, and simple consumer electronics, sporting goods, toys. Um, now, if you were uh, a region producing those goods, China's rise meant a major competitive shock. All of a sudden, you were facing really intense foreign competition. What we then observed was a decline in U.S. manufacturing employment. That's the blue line coming down here. In the face of import competition from China, the U.S. reoriented its, its economy we stopped producing those labor intensive goods. Factories shut down. We couldn't afford to compete against China when it came to apparel or footwear uh, or furniture. But what we could do was create technology. And so the IT part of the US economy expanded enormously as a consequence of China's growth with companies like Apple producing the technology that goes into cell phones that are assembled uh, in China. I wanna give you a view of what this meant for one particular place. And this is the city of, uh, of Martinsville, Virginia. It's a small town in Southwestern Virginia, far from Washington, DC and Alexandria and Arlington. Uh, it's part of a manufacturing belt that starts in Ohio and, uh, and West Virginia and Virginia and stretches in uh, to the deep South. Martinsville over the course of the 20th century became an industry town. Uh, in, to go back to 1990, an astounding 45% of, uh, of Martinsville's working age population was employed in one sector, in manufacturing. This was a place where the manufacturing factory was everything. Not only that, those factories basically produced two types of goods, furniture, its major, uh, its, its major industry, and also a knitted outerwear, a type of clothing. That left Martinsville, a town that had thrived on manufacturing in preceding decades, extremely vulnerable to import competition 
from China. And that competition for Martinsville was just brutal. What happened over the next 25 years was that the share of, of the working age folks in Martinsville employed in manufacturing fell from 45% to just 13%. That, and this was a consequence of the closure of factories that used to make that furniture uh, and those and that knitted outerwear. Now, you, you then imagine, well, what's going to happen in a place that was an industry town? The industry disappears. The most logical prediction might be, well, people are just going to leave. Uh, if jobs dry up, and if manufacturing looks like it's taken a hard hit, why would you hang around Martinsville if its major industry has disappeared? Prior to things like uh, the US experiencing import competition from China, that would have been the expectation of most economists too. That is when, when a region goes on hard times, when joblessness rises, people just leave and go find work elsewhere. The US is an incredibly dynamic economy. And so any concentrated joblessness is not likely uh, to survive for all that long. Well, to our surprise and chagrin, it did. Uh, few people left cities like Martinsville that had seen declines in manufacturing employment. <clears throat> what that meant is with fewer jobs around, how did Martinsville deal with this loss of manufacturing jobs? What it saw was an increase in joblessness. The fraction of Martinsville's population uh, of working age adults that had been employed in 1990 was a pretty healthy 73%. By 2016, it had fallen to an anemic 53%. So what that means is about two thirds of these workers who lost their manufacturing jobs basically ended up uh, out of work. And that joblessness, as, I, as we talked about just a little bit ago, then leads to uh, social dislocation. Families either don't form or they break up. Uh, kids are living with single parents who are earning low incomes and you have a higher likelihood of men and young men in particular doing risky things, uh, abusing drugs and alcohol, engaging in crime, or ending up uh, homeless. And this is what we saw played out in many of the places that, that had experienced this sort of intense manufacturing job loss. It's not just about uh, globalization uh, or uh, automation. It's also about um, changes in uh, the energy economy. Before we get there, I want to just highlight one feature about what made this job loss in, in places like Martinsville so painful. And that's that uh, manufacturing is one of these middle skill jobs. Um, for workers without a college education, manufacturing is one of the few sectors where you can make it into the middle class. So if we look at uh, annual earnings for men, um, for workers without a college education, uh, they're going to get about a $6,000 a higher level of income if they work in manufacturing on average than if they don't. Uh, for women, um, that, uh, that difference is, um, uh, is, uh, is uh, even a bit larger. So manufacturing jobs are good jobs when they disappear. It's going to be really painful for communities because high paying jobs have gone. That means spending is gone. And that means the equivalent of a localized recession. Something similar is, has played out, although on a smaller scale, regarding the ongoing energy transformation we, we see in the United States and in the world as a whole. And that is that the, the world is moving away from carbon-based uh, energy, uh, energy creation. This is seen, was seen first in changes in the use of coal, which is a, a you know, very dirty source of fuel, in which many regions um, have moved away from. But, what, but coal is produced in places where there are coal mines. And so cities near coal mines, small towns near coal mines, are really concentrated in that industry, just like Martinsville was uh, in furniture. So here's what happened in uh, the city of um, uh, the town of Grundy, Virginia, which is located in Buchanan County. And this comes from a very nice article in the New York Times by Eduardo Porter. You go back to the 1980s. Um, Grundy had a population of a little under 40,000 people. Um, uh, and you had, a, you know, you had a good fraction of the, those folks in coal, employed in coal. You had about 5,000 coal jobs in Grundy in, uh, the, uh, as a, uh, around 1990. This shift out of coal production in the U.S., which we've seen going on in the world as a whole, meant that the, those coal jobs just disappeared. 
Now, Grundy is a bit different from Martinsville. It actually saw people leave. Uh, so it saw a decline in population that we haven't seen in some of these manufacturing towns. What that means today is the folks who are left in Grundy are the folks who are, for whom you know, there are just not many other economic opportunities that they have available to, available to themselves. And so where have people turned? A lot of them have turned to the federal government for support with Social Security, Medicare, and other forms of public assistance um, being accounting for a substantial fraction of income uh, uh, in the town. So I mentioned also that um, uh, you know, a fourth factor here are just the, the long-lived impacts of severe recessions, which tend to hit some places harder uh, than others, but I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A uh, if there's interest. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is just what do we do about this? Uh, so what we've seen is that these regional divides have uh, appeared and deepened over a 30-year period. That suggests that getting, addressing them is not going to be easy. Um, they also came as something of a surprise. We thought migration would solve the problem. Uh, it hasn't. So what that means is we need to think about localized solutions to the absence of good jobs in these places that are in uh, uh, a situation of distress. So what do we do? So let's start with what doesn't seem to work. And so first on the list of many local policymakers is providing tax incentives to attract big firms. Bring in an auto factory, bring in Amazon, bring in um, uh, 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 Google or Facebook, uh, and that'll solve our problems. So it might seem like this would make sense, um, but in practice, it hasn't worked. What these tax incentives do is they do attract uh, firms in the industries that are targeted. If you offer huge tax subsidies to a company, uh, to an auto manufacturer to build an assembly facility in your, in your county, somebody's likely to come and you're gonna create some auto jobs. Uh, the consequence though, is often just the displacement of other jobs and you don't have much in the way of tax revenue left over to do other things that the community that uh, that communities need to have done. So the consequence is not a decline in employment in these places, but no net increase. And you're not, and 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 these sorts of tax incentives uh, oftentimes just end up kind of convincing firms, bribing firms, if you will, to do what they were going to do uh, anyways. What does seem to work? What does seem to work is trying to build the capabilities of workers and firms who are already in these places. One of the things we've learned that works is targeted worker training. And by targeted, I mean, you focus on the industries that are already in a place. Um, and you work with local employers and you ask, what sorts of skills do you want your workers to have? And then you work with existing community entities, community colleges are really good at this, and develop specialized training programs to help workers uh, uh, fit those needs. Recent research done by one of my colleagues here at, at Harvard, Larry Katz, has shown that in, in evaluating needs in uh, randomized control trials, that means in, in, in very easy to understand experimental settings, shows that the wage gains for these workers are substantial. Um, they can be anywhere from 15 to 30 percent uh, after a couple of years. And these programs are not that long. About, they're typically about uh, six months in length um, and are, are far cheaper than trying to bribe Amazon uh, to come to your city. A related thing that works is to target local businesses who are already there and improve their capabilities and their services. So this means providing extension services, enhancing logistics, improving digital connectivity, and helping firms find new markets for what, they're produce, for, for what they produce. Um, it can also mean encouraging firms to redevelop abandoned factories or abandoned structures, what we call brownfield sites. The costs of creating jobs through this sort of approach, uh, uh, Timothy Bartik, um, an economist at the Upjohn Institute has estimated, is one-tenth the cost of creating jobs uh, through tax breaks. So beyond that, we, we might also think about some things that, that cities are just trying um, that seem promising, 
uh, but for which evidence is, is not quite there yet. One is the importance of attracting skilled workers. You all are co college students will soon be college graduates. Everybody wants you to come and live and work in their communities. That's because cities that succeed in attracting college graduates are places that enjoy vibrant economic growth. Now, one of, one of the things that's missing in places like Martinsville or, uh, or, or, or Grundy are, are, are the college educated. As economic activity has declined, those are typically the first workers uh, to get out of there. So how do we bring college educated workers back in? Something that Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan has tried is offering student debt relief. That is, you're gonna forget that if you get a college graduate to, to be willing to live and work in your community for five years, you'll forgive uh, $10,000 in, in, uh, in student debt relief. Another idea, uh, and this is something I proposed with, with Matt Slaughter, he's the dean of the, the business school at, at, uh, at Dartmouth College, um, is to target skilled immigration visas to workers who are willing to live and work in distressed communities for a period of time. The idea here is that if you create a, a, a cadre, a kernel of high skilled workers, you're gonna attract firms that are gonna wanna invest and that can generate a vir virtuous cycle of then attracting more skilled workers uh, and more firms uh, to get economic growth going. Another thing we might think about is addressing a, a, a severe problem that is, exists in many of these distressed places, and that is their difficulty in getting access to finance. We're talking about companies that aren't listed on a stock exchange and that aren't big enough uh, uh, to raise money on bond markets. You gotta be a pretty, you gotta be a decent sized company uh, to raise capital by issuing bonds or issuing stock. As a, as a consequence, many of the entrepreneurs uh, in these activities they raise money the way a lot of us uh, tap into money and that's by using our homes as equity. But if you're in a distressed community, what's likely happened to home values? Home values are probably deteriorating. And so your source of, uh, of investment capital uh, has diminished. So what we might think of are inventive ways of providing access to finance to small and medium-sized businesses in these places which are typically the engine of job growth uh, in many uh, communities. Um, I'm happy to talk about more um, of these ideas and in more detail uh, as we get to the Q&A. So let's go back to where we started, which was that image I wanted you to have in your mind of what does a healthy local economy look like? And number one on that list should be people have a job. So our role as economists um, and, our, uh, and, and policymakers and local business folks and civic leaders in thinking about how you turn around distressed communities, it is about raising employment rates and expanding the, enhancing the employability of the people who are there and uh, the, des uh, the desire on the part of firms uh, to, uh, to invest uh, and create new jobs. Um, absent that approach, uh, and absent a dedicated effort to try and deal with these pockets of distress, that map I showed you at the start, uh, which characterized that in sharp increase in joblessness over the last 30 years uh, is only likely uh, to get worse. COVID has made this all the more challenging. And so time is really uh, of the essence. So that's what I have for my prepared remarks. Um, appreciate you, uh, uh, lending me your ears during this time, and I'd be happy to take uh, questions, comments, and, and hear some of your thoughts. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Gordon. That was a phenomenal talk. I've been promoting your talk um, for a while, saying that um, you're a really great speaker and you definitely didn't disappoint us. So uh, you're always clear and insightful, and I, I really appreciate everything I've learned from you as well. If I might jump right into the questions, um, so I have a lot, I have a list of five or six, but I want to get to some of the students' questions first. One of them uh, is tied into that idea that you mentioned at the very beginning of your talk, which is much to our chagrin as economists, we don't understand why people don't leave, right? And so I have kind of a two-part question is why, you didn't really go into why you think people don't leave. And we've known that especially uh, more educated people are more likely to leave. You mentioned that. 
Um, but secondly, when you tie that in with your solutions, uh, what's to keep trained people from then just leaving and going to somewhere else? So could you maybe comment a little bit on the migration of, of people then? Sure. Um, and, and these are really good questions. So when it comes to mobility uh, of workers, what we notice is an asymmetry. When a place is having really dramatic, dramatic uh, job growth, people are gonna move in. Um, and it turns out among the most mobile workers in the US economy are the foreign born, which is not too surprising because they're gonna not necessarily have uh, strong family ties to particular regions shortly after arriving uh, in the country. But we observe on the other end, when job growth declines, we don't observe corresponding outflows to the magnitudes of these, uh, of these shocks. So what's going on here? So one thing is that, uh, you know, we, we overestimate the mobility of the American workforce because a small number of people move a lot. And so when a place goes into economic decline, you're dealing with just the kind of a random set of people in that economy. They're, your random person is just not very likely to move. So that's one thing. Uh, a second thing is that when you go into a period of decline, what often happens is people are suffering financial distress on a bunch of different fronts. And that can mean a decline in home values. It, mean, it can mean a business uh, that's in trouble. It could mean relatives that are in need of help. All of those things are anchors keeping you um, where you are. Here's a third thing that we really just come uh, to appreciate. This absence of mobility is by far and away the strongest among workers uh, who, are, uh, who, who don't have a college education. Those workers, one, just have never been as mobile as college educated workers. But two, increasingly the way, uh, the way Americans live um, and that is that mom and dad are less likely than not are not both living in the same household with the kids. So what does that mean? You've got a substantial fraction of folks for whom mobility, it's not a two body problem. It's how do we find jobs for mom and dad? Um, it's a two household problem. How do we get two people who, may, who are not uh, living together to make a decision to move uh, elsewhere? And that highlights the importance of your family network and your reliance on that family network. So we've really changed our view on the mobility issue um, in, the past, uh, in the past 15 years or so. And so now there's just a lot of pessimism about it. That same pessimism means that in particular, when you're talking about the, the non-college educated, we're we're not super worried about uh, the, the, uh, the exodus of folks we're gonna get uh, this training. That targeted training typically goes to more disadvantaged workers who aren't, uh, who aren't that mobile. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's, that's really helpful. One of the other questions in the chat was about some of the proposals that have been floated on the federal level, uh, particularly living stipends or universal income uh, maintenance, a minimum guaranteed income or that sort of thing. How effective would a federal policy like that be on uh, addressing these regional income inequalities? Um, okay, this is a, a public talk. And so I get to speak with my public hat on and not with my academic hat on where everything has to be fully rigorous. So I'm gonna give you my unvarnished opinion. Um, I think universal uh, basic income would be a terrible way to deal with these issues. And that's because it is not targeted at all. Where do we wanna help? We wanna help people without a job in Grundy and Martinsville. So what we sh should we be doing we should be targeting our assistance to the jobless in Grundy, in Grundy and Martinsville. And UBI just doesn't do that. It's untargeted. Uh, and, and, and because it's untargeted, it's incredibly expensive. And we actually have a federal policy on the books that works pretty well at raising employment rates among those with low wages. And that's the earned income tax credit. So what that means is that if your income is below some amount, below $16,000 a year, for every dollar you earn, the government is going to kick in as much as, uh, as an extra 40 cents. So this can be a, a sizable boost to your earnings, really strengthening those, those work incentives. The problem with the way that this policy is implemented in the U.S. is that basically the only people who are eligible for it are those with a couple of kids. So if you're a young single uh, person trying to make a go of it, 
you're going to get at most $500 a year out of this program. And, and what that means is that some of these folks, these disadvantaged workers who really want to get going on a career, uh, it's not available to them. That would be a fantastic program to expand beyond uh, those with kids to those without. Mm -hmm. So if I may expand on this a little bit and, and push you because <laughs> we've known each other for a long time. You don't need to see, I know you're not going to mind if I push you a little bit. But one of the things as trade economists that I think I learned in your class and, and in other classes uh, was that the government has known about the adverse effects on wages and employment of trade, you know, since Stolper and Samuelson, I mean, going way, way back, right? And there have been these programs like trade adjustment assistance, which have been designed to specifically give training to displaced workers. So I guess one question I have is, I mean, you didn't mention trade adjustment assistance at all. So I'm wondering kind of why you didn't mention that. But then secondly, is how different are these targeted training programs uh, from the TAA programs that we've seen in the past? Uh, yeah, really good question. So uh, trade adjustment assistance is a program that was created all the way back in the 1960s. Um, and what it does is it provides help to workers who've lost their jobs as a result of import competition. So, so far you're thinking, great, this, this should have helped workers in, uh, in Martinsville. So in the 1990s and 2000s, there were two problems with the policy. One is that it just wasn't very big. Um, and when we look at what happened in terms of government assistance to places like Martinsville, where, there, where, where trade con contributed to manufacturing job loss, what we find is that government assistance increases by a fair bit for every kind of every thousand dollars of imports per worker in your place that of competition that you face, you're gonna pull in about an extra $60 per worker of government assistance. Of that $60, 23 cents came from trade adjustment assistance. So for all intents and purposes, it just, it was immaterial. Um, now there's a second problem with the policy. And that is, as it's written, that money can be used for a bunch of different stuff. It can actually be used to move to, for relocation assistance or to pay off medical bills. Um, but the way it's put into practice, all of it uh, goes, in, uh, goes into uh, training and not a training program that the government is saying is there. You can just use it. You gotta go find your training program yourself. Uh, so if the local government in Martinsville is getting hammered by factory closures and declining property values, they're probably not going to be expanding training programs for the local population. Uh, now, the, the provision of training is good and work by Ben Hyman, who's an um, uh, economist at the Federal Reserve Bank, he's found that workers really benefit from this. Um, you probably want it to be more flexible than that, though, so that some workers who want to use it to, say, start a small business, or the few who do want to move, that they can use it for that. So it's not designed with sufficient flexibility uh, uh, in mind. We have a question for one of my colleagues, another economist at the Bush School, who's wondering, um, just as an overall assessment, if we were to step back and look at uh, your, your presentation from a bird's eye view, could you uh, evaluate the relative importance of your four factors? Um, yeah, good question. Um, so <clears throat> if, um, if we look over, say, the full suite from 1980 to the present, uh, over, over that four decade period, um, technological change is certainly gonna be the biggest factor uh, because it affects all parts of the economy, not just manufacturing, not just the energy sector, it affects retail, it uh, affects wholesale trade, it affects sales, it just affects all sorts of stuff. Um, now, the thing about that, uh, the, the caveat to that is technological change doesn't happen overnight. It happens slowly and it's spread more widely. So the thing about the China shock and the energy transformation is that their impacts were much more concentrated in time and space. So that meant that those two things account for more of that concentrated hardship. Uh, so you gotta kinda, it's, um, this sounds like a classically economic answer where um, on the one hand, uh, on the other. So in terms of the total drag on, on wages for, for non-college educated workers, technological change is way out ahead. In terms of concentrated pockets of, of pain, those other two factors are, are on pretty good footing. Awesome. 
Um, so I have another question here from the audience that's kind of saying, so let's say you want to attract these college educated workers, right? And that was very clear and we love that policy uh, or migrants even for that high qualified migrants, right? Um, what would you expect them to do once they get there, right? I mean, they're going to this area which is distressed and there's a lot of unemployment. Maybe there's a lot of production workers you could hire. I mean, are you thinking they're gonna start their own businesses or they're gonna be increasing the technological uh, change within the firms that are there to hire more? What, what, what kind of jobs would they take? Yeah, so here is why, um, here's where um, the state and local actors really become uh, important. Um, and that's because you know, where you're gonna generate job growth varies a lot according to the characteristics of a place. So think about Lehigh, Pennsylvania. Um, distinguishing thing about Lehigh, Pennsylvania, two things. One, it got hit hard by manufacturing job loss. Second is you've got some major healthcare facilities in the area that serve the regional economy. So there you've got an anchor for job growth. Um, you think about uh, West Hickory, North Carolina. Um, that's an area, another furniture manufacturing place got hit really hard. It's not far from some, from some areas that have expanded because of tourism and the hospitality industry and people buying second homes. So that's uh, a possibility. Um, when you, uh, I really, for those who are interested in this, I really encourage you to find Timothy Bartik's uh, website. A number of his papers are also uh, put out to the Brookings Institution. The thing that he really comes back to is if you don't ground these policies in local actors, uh, and this can be nonprofit organizations, it can be churches, it can be labor unions, it can be business associations. If you don't ground them in uh, something local, they're probably not gonna work. Uh, Jim and Debbie Fallows did this, wrote this great book where they, they, um, they're pilots, they got in a, their little small plane and went around and visited a bunch of small and medium sized cities in the US and they, they looked at what worked and what didn't. And civic engagement, which comes in many different forms in, in different places, is kind of a constant throughout. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask you another question? Uh, one thing that you mentioned that I was one of your first students, and thanks for mentioning that, that brings back good memories for me. But, um, and, and we started, I think, at the same time as a, me as a student and you as a professor the same year. But before that, we actually met in Mexico City because you were presenting at the Colegio de Mexico when I was on a Fulbright there. Um, so we actually met even before we got started, which was kind of fun. But that what makes me wonder about Mexico. Like you haven't mentioned, I know you have a lot of history studying Mexico and uh, we've studied Mexico. I've learned a lot about Mexico from you, but you didn't mention Mexico at all. So I'm kind of wondering what has been the role in terms of like the USMCA or NAFTA and also Mexican migration in uh, contributing to some of these regional divides? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought up Mexico and I wanna mention it in, in two ways. I'll get to your question in just a second. Um, Mexico has its own regional economic divides problem. And that's a split between the industrial north uh, that is more urban, uh, that is more educated, and that is tied into the North American economy. And the more rural, the less educated, the perennially impoverished South. But that to Mexico's problem, the two Americas problem, we see it in France, you see it in Germany, you see it in Great Britain, you're increasingly seeing it in China. Uh, it is a feature of modern economies that are all subject to uh, these different shocks to varying degrees of, the, uh, of intensity. So what role did Mexico play in all of this? So for those of you who are students of politics and you think back um, to the 1992 presidential election, you'll re uh, remember uh, fondly a famous Texan, Ross Perot, who ran as an independent populist in that year uh, and predicted that NAFTA would be just a disaster for the, for the US economy and create a giant sucking sound pulling um, 6 million jobs across the border uh, into the country. Um, now, what, what actually happened? Um, nothing close to that. There were some areas that were hurt by import competition uh, uh, with Mexico. Um, and uh, uh, John McLaren and Shoshana Kakabayan have a, have a paper that, that, that documents this. Um, but what Mexico also did was it strengthened value chains in North America, in aerospace, in automobiles, in medical devices. And that helped create some jobs that the US um, that probably wouldn't have created otherwise or hold on to some jobs that we might have lost to China uh, 
uh, um, uh, in the breach. So to give you an example of that, the Pratt and Whitney airplane engine, um, which is finally assembled in Canada, um, starts with metal stamping that occurs in Riverside, crosses the border into uh, uh, to Mexicali in Baja California, um, and gets processed into parts that go to an assembly facility in Holy, Alabama, and then finally end up in Canada where all those parts, all, all the different subassembly pieces get turned into a, a jet aircraft engine. Uh, so those things were, those, those were on the, uh, the plus side. Now, what about Mexican uh, migration? So I mentioned how migrants are pretty mobile. Uh, and migrants are also drawn to places where they're job growth. Now, some of that job growth comes because you have booming construction or you have, um, you know, the places like Silicon Valley where there's, you know, tech, the tech sector is growing and there's big demand in the service sector. Other types of job growth have come because America has educated or aged itself out of supplying workers who, who are willing to do the farm work or work in meatpacking or poultry processing. And those Mexican immigrants came in and kept that industrial plant alive. So if you, if you go through the meatpacking region of the Great Plains, those places are incredibly grateful for Mexican immigration because it kept meatpacking there and the absence of those workers was lost. Uh, so the migrant workers weren't going to Martinsville or weren't going to Grundy. And so you weren't seeing labor market competition from immigrant workers in places that, uh, that were being hit. So one of the big initiatives that we've seen uh, in the United States, maybe as part of the COVID crisis, but also the forces that you talk about is this idea of reshoring of global value chains. So how uh, optimistic are you about our potential for reshoring, bringing back some of that production from China, or maybe instead of bringing it to the United States, to Alabama, or like you mentioned, um, how uh, possible is it that we could bring that production to Mexico, northern Mexico, and really develop a North American economy? So when you talk about reshoring production, you want to distinguish between reshoring output and reshoring employment because they're completely different things. Um, the factories that closed down in Martinsville had been built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. They were deploying mid-century technology that was quite labor intensive. Suppose we we're able to bring back some furniture manufacturing. It'd be a completely different technology. So even if we reshore some of that production, it's gonna be much, much less labor intensive. Still good for the U.S. economy. Um, you know, if, if that's where our comparative advantage is heading, we, you know, uh, that's a, uh, an entirely welcome development. But it seems quite unlikely to represent a major source of job growth. Realize that manufacturing now accounts for only about eight percent of employed U.S. workers. So you just and and the, the scale of the problem is way beyond the capacity of manufacturing uh, to solve it since our big success in manufacturing in the last 30 years is just to stop the decline. Mm -hmm. So, but do you think the USMCA is going to contribute to bringing some of that uh, production or jobs, either one, uh, from China? Or do you think that the USMCA's changes relative to NAFTA kind of make it more difficult for us to integrate even with Mexico? Yeah, I can, uh, uh, keeping my public speaking hat on, I can <laughs> say quite enthusiastically that the USMCA was a big step backwards in US-Mexico economic relations. Uh, we added trade barriers, and in particular in, in auto production, one of our really successful North American production chains. And then we also, because of the, the, the way, the nature of these sunset clauses that are built in, we created uncertainty about the longevity of the trade agreement. Business hates uncertainty. Uncertainty reduces investment. Um, so we took a trade agreement, which wasn't, you know, it wasn't the economic miracle that was proclaimed by President Clinton in the U.S. or President Salinas in Mexico at the time. Um, but it was just fine and did a number of good things. And, and we've made it worse. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wish I had another question. To, uh, <laughs> I do have some other questions, but I don't want to end on that note. So <laughs> one of the other questions that I had that, um, that you talked about were some of these uh, 
trade agreements just generally, right? I mean, you mentioned the USMCA, but we don't have a trade agreement with China, but we've heard a lot in the last several years about the evils of trade agreements, right? And how they're actually causing other problems. Um, can you comment on some of these other trade agreements that we've had and maybe some of the labor provisions in those agreements that might be designed to, to help workers? Are they helping these divides or are they, what effect are they having? Yeah, so think about one of our biggest complaints about China. One of our biggest complaints about China is that Chinese firms have stolen the technology of American firms, um, either just outright uh, um, or by mandating that U.S. firms, when they invest in China, have to take on uh, a joint venture partners. And as, at the end of the day, those firms end up uh, appropriating the technology that is being used and, and, and cut U.S. companies out. Um, the complaints here are real. Uh, they're well documented, and they also go against the commitments that China made at, when it joined the World Trade Organization. So what we have is a very good trade agreement with, uh, with an apparatus in place that we can make formal complaints against China and enact tariff penalties against China uh, as uh, in response to uh, Tits misbehavior. And we're not the only co country that has those concerns. So if the US were to work with the European Union and Japan and Canada, uh, entities um, and the countries of Southeast Asia, places that might be nervous to take on China as their own, as a coalition, we might be able to generate more change. The U.S. hasn't approached China um, with the strength of its partners in the recent past. What it's done is approach China bilaterally, um, and the progress has been, uh, has been nil. So I would say that we have existing trade agreements in place, in particular the World Trade Organization, that allow us uh, that give us some quite effective tools that we just aren't utilizing. Well, but part of it is we've been blocking the appellate justices' appointments for the last several years, right? So now there aren't any, we basically disabled that type of appeals mechanism in the WTO. So isn't that something, do you expect that to be remedied in the new administration or? Uh, I do. Um, and that was something that the Trump administration did, but I don't want to just say that this is a problem of, of one party government versus another. The Obama administration didn't form a coalition to take on China effectively. Um, it was focused on trying to get the Trans-Pacific Partnership passed, and uh, and that took precedence. Um, I think in retrospect, that might have been that that's a perfectly fine trade agreement, but the priority should have been aggressively countering China once we came to understand that it really wasn't living up to its commitments. Wow. Well, you know, I would love to go on talking with you for hours. And I know you have to get going. We have to get going. So I want to thank you very much. And I'm hoping everyone will join me in, in thanking Professor Hansen for his wonderful and insightful remarks. Uh, thanks, Raymond. Uh, thanks to the folks who uh, sat in today. Um, uh, sorry this can't be in person, uh, but great to be with you. My, um, my oldest daughter was born in, in Texas. I lived in uh, Austin. I'm sorry I worked at UT. I know that's <laughs> Uh, and so I have, have many fond memories uh, of the state. Well, hopefully we'll bring you back soon. If you wouldn't mind joining us in person, maybe next time. Thank you very much, everybody.